I'm going to talk about what it takes to restore individual responsibility in America today. Um, one of the great satisfactions, one of the many satisfactions of leaving adolescence, uh, getting past that, was the realization that you could actually make a difference in life. I lucked into this summer job when I was 18 at the Oak Ridge National Lab where I was working for these, the world's top scientists, and they actually took me seriously, even though I was 18 years old. It took me a while to grow into the responsibility. They kept giving me more and more, and by the third summer, they were having me do independent research and publish papers. And at the end of that period, these smartest people in the world, much smarter than I was, I realized that life was what you could make of it. It was your ideas that mattered. And that's embodied in the idea of responsibility. You all know how important it is in your own lives. You know that nothing good happens unless people take individual responsibility to make it happen. That's true of all the successes you've had in life. You haven't succeeded because you dutifully followed the rules or filled out the forms properly. You've succeeded because you put your heart and soul into something. That's the only way anything ever happens. It's embodied in every activity, whether it's coaching a little league team, being a great scientist, persuading a customer that your product is better. You have to take responsibility to make these things happen. Maybe the best summary description of this idea, which is the part of the can-do spirit of America, was a wonderful line by Edison, nothing that's any good works by itself. You gotta make the damn thing work. And this is the idea that actually captured the public imagination when, president, when Barack Obama ran for president in his slogan, yes, we can. People actually believed we could. Now let's turn from that, that sort of series of ideas, which I think you'll all agree with, to the state of our society today. It's no secret that things aren't working very well. Schools have been failing despite decades of reform. It's certainly a good thing that health care will now be available to everybody, but it may prove to be a Pyrrhic victory if it's unaffordable. Some states, California and New York come to mind, are teetering on the brink of insolvency with no solution in sight. According to Pew Research, public confidence in government is at an all-time low. You can read these headlines year after year, and it's enough to almost make you tear your hair out. But the truth is that all these things have a solution, or at least a path to a solution, and it's obvious. And the solution is this. The people in responsibility have to make different choices. It's not that hard. Schools, there are plenty of good schools, including in the most challenging neighborhoods. What does it take to have a good school? People in charge make different choices. The teachers are all on the same page. You instill the values of respect and, and order in the school. You enforce those values. You know how it works. It's happened in Denver. It's happened everywhere. It happens in charter schools. It happens in parochial schools. It happens in some public schools. It doesn't happen in most public schools. How about health care? Health care is not unaffordable in this country. The experts tell us that we waste almost a trillion dollars a year in unnecessary health care with bureaucratic inefficiencies and overuse of expensive services. So what's needed to change that? Everybody, everybody involved, patients, doctors, hospitals, have to take responsibility to be more prudent in their use of health care resources. We have to align the incentives so that people feel that they have that responsibility. Instead, the incentives today are to do the opposite. Just do whatever health care, the elaborate bureaucratic guidelines will reimburse. The reason the choices aren't being made throughout our society to fix all these seemingly intractable problems is because no one can take responsibility to make the choices, or they don't feel they can. And why can't they? Because they've been preempted by law. Tens and thousands of discrete laws and regulations that have built up over the decades. Even the president is powerless to do things that everybody thinks he should do. Recently, it came out that there was a um, uh, $5 billion of economic stimulus money in the bill passed 15 months ago to weatherproof 590,000 homes in America. It's a good thing for America. Had not been spent because of a 1931 law signed into law by President Herbert Hoover 
that requires that for any construction project with federal funding that the wages be set as a matter of law in each of 3,000 different localities. So for the last 15 months, teams of bureaucrats have been setting the wages for weatherproofers in Grand Junction, Colorado, and Monmouth County, New Jersey, and Spokane, Washington. Meanwhile, another winter's gone by without 590,000 homes being, being weatherproofed, and we didn't stimulate the economy when we needed it. This makes central planning seem efficient. It's a law that's 80 years old that hand cuffs the President of the United States and Congress from doing what they want to do. Why can't schools maintain order? They're drowning in law. A few years ago, the group I chair, Common Good, did a survey of all the laws that affect one school in New York City. Turns out that if you want to suspend a student, which involves not sending the student to jail, but home, there are over 60 legal steps and legal considerations including three levels of appeal required in order to do that. We put it on a chart, it was five feet long of bubbles. And you wonder why there's no, no order in, in, in public schools. All this law prevents people unintentionally from taking responsibility. And then there's one other thing. Once you actually get approval or think you can, the way our litigation system works now, anybody who doesn't like it can sue and hold it up for another few years. So just yesterday, there was an announcement that, um, uh, that the Department of Interior, after 10 years in review by 17 different agencies, had approved wind farms off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, finally, this is a good thing, it's clean energy. Finally, New England's going to get some clean energy, but not so fast. The next day, 12 lawsuits were filed, mostly alleging that the review for the last 10 years had been inadequate. So it's nice to aspire to yes we can, but if you visit any school, hospital, government agency, most institutions in life, the main message is no you can't. And we all feel that hesitation. You know when you're asked to do something, well is there a rule for that? Might I violate the rule? Might, it, might someone get upset and claim it violates your rights? Could someone have an accident? Pretty soon people are pulling, should you put an arm around the crying child? Not in America. You're told not to. Who will defend you if someone says that was inappropriate? So we find ourselves paralyzed just as our government is paralyzed for exactly the same reason. So what's needed to restore a culture of responsibility? Well, it's going to be a big task, but there are three steps that are needed. The first step is we have to change our own attitude. We have to abandon the idea that we can tell people how to do things. Responsibility requires free choice. People with responsibility need to be given a goal, they can be given a set of governing principles, but they can't be told how to do their jobs. Responsibility is simple in the sense that riding a bicycle is simple, but it's extremely complex in all the nuances required to get it done properly. Just think of prudence, balance, the current needs against future needs, all of the elements, the judgment that go in to exercising responsibility. And just as a robot, can't ride a bicycle. A complex legal code can't dictate sensible choices without almost immediately careening out of control and crashing. And that's what we've done to our society. Now, most of you, and I like the idea of taking responsibility ourselves, we're a little more leery of perhaps giving somebody else, particularly somebody above us in the hierarchy, the, the ability to take responsibility but we have to get over that. Responsibility starts at the top, not the bottom. If the principal doesn't have the authority to make choices about making exceptions or what's good for the school now, then what good are the teacher's ideas? What good are the parents' ideas? If the principal doesn't have the authority to balance the needs of all the kids and has to give in to the to some uh, selfish parents pounding the table to get everything for their child, pretty soon other parents are going to do the same thing. And pretty soon what you're going to get is a society where everyone treats the common good, they're grabbing at the common good as if it were a dead carcass. If we don't have authority with people making those choices saying this is enough, this is too much, then the whole society's sense of responsibility to, to, begins to fray 
And giving those people responsibility is the only way we can hold them accountable. Just look at today. Everybody blames. Who's there to blame? Washington is exhibit A. People point their fingers at each other all day long, year after year, because no one has responsibility to make it happen. And it's only when they take personal responsibility to make this work, whether it's the, to build a nuclear power plant or to make the school work, can we actually begin to restore a sense of true democratic accountability in our society. So that requires changing our attitude. That's hard enough. The next part's even harder. We're going to have to clean, clean out decades of accumulated law. There's no way with all this law piled up that people can accomplish anything. It's like sediment in the harbor. We just can't get anywhere anymore. And you can't restore responsibility by tweaking the system. You certainly can't contain health care costs by piling 2,700 pages of new statutes on top of the 50,000 pages of existing statutes and expect that the system's going to work any differently. It'll work better in the sense that we're covering more people, but it's not going to save that trillion dollars of cost. Now, this is not the first time that governments have failed. I mean, throughout human history, governments fail. Uh, the inertial forces take governments to some place where it no longer responds to society's needs. In the old days, when government failed, we just overthrew the king, like our founders did with George III. Of course, in democracy, we supposedly have the power to replace everybody, new, new leaders every four years or so, but it doesn't seem to elect, it doesn't seem to matter much who we elect. You know, Obama comes into Washington on this mighty steed of public opinion and immediately gets stuck in the goo. So who's the villain? Who do we have to overthrow? The villain is a blob. It's a blob of accumulated laws and regulations for decades. It's what philosopher Hannah Arendt called the rule of nobody. That's what's wrong with our society. No one's in charge. So what's needed is clear. We have to clean out our legal system and reconnect public goals to real people who can take responsibility to meet them. That way they have a chance of succeeding, and if they fail, we can hold them accountable. This will require spring cleaning of historic proportions. It may even take constitutional amendments. So ideas that have been thrown out are a constitutional amendment requiring an automatic sunset of laws so Congress is forced to see how existing laws are working every 10 years or so. It may take constitutional amendments and campaign finance so we can break the grip of special interest. So Congress has to respond to us, not the special interest. But then you might ask, reasonably, at the end of all this, how do we do this? And the answer is, Washington is a lagging indicator. It's not going to do it unless we force it to do it. I mean, look at what's going on there. It's not going to happen. Neither party has this on their agenda. Special interest will do all in their power to prevent any kind of spring cleaning from happening. Why do you think special interests are powerful? It's not because, just because of the money. They could spend all the money in the world and nobody could pass a law as stupid as forcing wages to be set in 3,000 different localities today. They're powerful because they're protected by existing law. That's what they exist to do, is to keep it there. It's a hundred times harder to repeal a law than to pass a law because you have these armies of special interests surrounding every nut and bolt. So, going back to William's point, that leaves us. We have to create a movement. It's not a partisan movement. It's not a movement to deregulate. It's a movement to make regulation work. It's not a movement to get rid of helping people or social safety nets. It's to make them work better and to make them affordable. And the core principle of this movement is one thing, which is to restore individual responsibility at every level of society. We have to reconnect our public goals to real people. That's what's missing. That's why we're all so frustrated. That's why doing things is so important. That's why this conference is so important. But it's not going to happen unless we take responsibility to make it happen. And so some of us are trying to get a movement together, 
And if you're interested, I'd like to talk to you.